Hi, I'm Larry Digna. I'm here with ZDNet, and we're here with Randy Gaborio. He is the CIO of Christiana Care, and they've done some interesting work with Alexa Skills and Home Care. Hi, Randy. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks for having me, Larry. So, I guess walk me through the project, like how you got started with Alexa Skills, and you know how it applies to home care. Home care. So, broadly speaking, for us, we know voice is going to become the most common pathway for interaction with patients. And the reason is obviously is it's, it's, it's the most natural way to interact. And as we think about how can, we, how can we use voice to allow the patient to communicate in ways that are natural from a process perspective and even using the language that's natural for them. So, uh, and then you start factoring in things, Larry, like the percentage of search each year that's gone up in terms of mobile and then voice driven search. Sort of the trade winds are moving that direction. So as we thought about sort of the portfolio of capabilities that we want to start introducing for patient level interaction and even clinical interaction, we've directed a lot of energy around voice capabilities. So that sort of set the, the foundational work, the substrate on which why we want to do voice. And then the particular scenario uh, in this application had a, a particular sort of clinical purpose where we married the two together. So as far as, you know, natural language and patience, is, is Alexa natural enough at this uh, point? Well, let's say the, the trajectory with which things are moving and the accuracy level that we're at today, it's, it is really close. I would suggest that somewhere over the next three to five years, we're going to have an accuracy level that is so high that, you know, we'll have... Um, you know, the, the, clinical, the clinical language, which, you know, you can already do that today, right? You run Dragon medical versions in a clinical setting. It's got the sort of the pre-programmed library. It knows certain things about, you know, uh, measurements, you know, in CCs and different therapeutic regimen names and things like that. Uh, but for what we're doing, yes, voice is good enough. It's, it's adequate and it's, in, it's sophisticated enough, but it's also familiar enough for people to be able to sort of naturally interact in a way that feels so comfortable to them that actually they can actually begin to sort of feel in a way sort of a relationship because they're communicating in a way that's natural for human beings. So as far as developing, you know, this Alexa skills, you, you had a couple variables to consider, right? You had to consider HIPAA and then, you know, just the programming, um, you know, I, I guess what you have to do there to make it, you know, comply with that regulation. Yeah. So first, you know, part of it is we, we began our sort of Alexa skill journey before Amazon was ready to, to do what's called a BAA or business associate agreement of with which they are, they're basically complying with the sort of the rule set associated with HIPAA. So obviously you know, HIPAA begins with everything we do in terms of uh, not just the compliance, but thinking about what do we need the information to do and where does it really need to reside uh, and transit. Uh, the big breakthrough really around this was Amazon's capability of supporting uh, that information in a HIPAA compliant way. So we didn't actually have to build the HIPAA components. We built in a platform that was now HIPAA compliant, being the Alexa skill environment. In the, in the, I guess walk me through some use cases. So you, you have a patient, it, it's under home, he's under, he or she's under home care. Um, and, and what would they use Alexa for exactly? All right, so let's, let's, let's give the real world example of, of one that we most recently launched, which is this home care coach. So entirely reasonable. You end up and you say, let's say you go through a knee replacement. And here you are. You go from what used to be a place where you'd spend multiple days in the hospital to then maybe into an inpatient rehab and then to a home rehab scenario. You know, now when it comes to things like knee replacement, you know, we're, we're getting patients realizing clinically foot to floor within hours of procedure to basically begin rehabbing. But when that patient transitions into the home setting, and this is a real a, sort of a realistic theme in all of healthcare no matter how great sort of discharge information is about what you need to do, human beings are not at a point where it's easy to absorb that information when you're sort of in that discharge state, even when you're paired with sort of a caregiver or an advocate who's alongside with you. And then think about what's the care regimen that you need to administer at home. So in this case, envision you're sent home and day one, a home health nurse shows up 
and they're doing physical rehab. They're getting you started. They're getting you trained on your exercises. They're doing those exercises with you. And under the normal course of action, you would do some exercises and that home health nurse doing the PT work would return perhaps the next day, depending on the acuity level and what your needs were, maybe at 48 hours. But instead, we now supplement that nurse, that PT therapist with Alexa. And Alexa, you can engage with and say, hey, Alexa, what are my exercises today? And Alexa can begin to say, well, your care plan specifically calls for day one, we want you doing 25 steps. And then it's day two. Hey, Alexa, what are my exercises? Oh, we need you to do a, you know, a right flexion or this sort of therapeutic move. And it can explain to you how to actually do those exercises. Raise your arm, move your knee, do this sort of thing. Oh, it's day three. Alexa, what are my exercises? Today, we want you doing one flight up, one flight down. And then envision the ability to say, did you successfully do that flight of steps? Did it hurt? Did it hurt your, you know, the inside of your knee? That's right. So we can begin this conversation, this dialogue. So we're at what we define sort of, I say just, we're really just scratching the surface in terms of the capability that we can bring. And this all sits underneath, um, Larry, sort of a big, just a thesis for us, which is this concept of, all care will be digital, except that which cannot be, and all care will be in the home, except that which cannot be. And that sort of drives our thesis to build these capabilities into a scenario where it matches the life flow and the location where the patient wants to be. And, and the physician would load in these, these programs like weekly or I guess, is, is it preloaded based on, like if I said I had pain on the um, you know, inside of my knee, then Alexa would know to alter? Yeah, so gen one of the world is that the care plan is loaded in kind of a push fashion. Gen two begins to capture this concept of taking feedback. Gen three is where we actually do things like say, you know, now it's time to change the, the, the dressing around the wound. Now, here's what your wound should look like at day three. And you know what, let's un undress your wound and take a picture of it. And then it gets sent up into our environment and AI will look at it and determine, is there something risky here? And then hand it off to the patient. So here we are in the world where we're gen one, but we will have the iterations around this that creates uh, a care pathway that's dynamic for what the patient is actually experiencing and can get kicked out out of, a, out of, a, out of an automated workflow, can kick out to engaging the human being at any given point where clinically we determine it's the case. Say the wound doesn't look appropriate, then it gets kicked out and maybe there's a conversation and maybe there's a determination that says, let's send a wound care nurse into the home. And we're doing that for the patients that are in need and capturing those at the earliest signal by when we're saying today is the first day you should change the dressing. So this whole process um, is really, <laughs> about changing and building a, what we call a digital care pathway, where you get sort of agency for the patient and a comfort with the patient to be able to communicate with the technology, and it doesn't change the natural flow of the rhythm for the patient. In fact, it's more convenient because you don't have to do it in, an, in, a, in a synchronous fashion. You can do these ways in asynchronous ways as well. Okay. Um, so what came first? Was it this project or did you have a digital transformation project, you know, kind of in the works and a strategy? Because what I've seen in a lot of like um, healthcare settings is, you know, they, they had projects that would be deemed, you know, less than successful. And then COVID came and suddenly they look successful. Um, so I guess what was the digital transformation strategy leading up to this? Right, so, so broadly speaking, that comes back to that theme that I had outlined, which was all care will be digital, except that which cannot be. And that starts with us for the sort of the thesis of, we know that the sort of the, the economics of care already don't work. When we look at several things, when we look at our unit cost to produce care, and we look at the model under which we're building physical real estate to push patients through into that model. Once you build four walls, you've actually created a constraint. And so our view is as you build virtually and digitally, you have this sort of unlimited sort of capacity in terms of the, and then the cost to add a marginal sort of patient into that model is extremely low. So by going virtual and digital, you unlock capacity. You then don't require patients to necessarily move and orchestrate around the care system. 
So we look at care in the, in the near past, let's sort of say what's still the reality today, is it's orchestrated around the reimbursement flow, and then the provider flow is constructed from that, and last and least in American healthcare, the patient flow is last. In fact, let's, if you and I walk into a, 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 a provider office, and one of the challenges, you see patients sitting there, and really, those patients, in a way, are really sort of healthcare's inventory, right? And one of the challenges is that we don't value the cost of the patient time because they sit, and we've all been through this, you go into a clinic, you sit for 40 minutes, you then get called back to the exam room, you wait for another 12 minutes, and the like. So our thesis is we can change the access model, we can align it with the life flow of the patient, we can deliver care where it needs to be done, and we can do it in what we believe is a high-tech, high-touch fashion by doing this work digitally and reducing the unit cost to produce a healthy outcome. So that's the theme behind our, our digital platform. But we don't, we're not out running ahead of the clinical universe. All the work that we do starts with an acute clinical scenario and we co-build this work with our clinical partners. So we, I could take you through another example, one called Crititrack, which we built, which is a capability for dealing with patients on the inpatient side when a patient codes in the acute care setting. And we built an app that developed, uh, developed in conjunction with the intensive medicine uh, expertise around how do you guide and measure all the components that take place when a patient actually does code, timing the respiratory rate, the, um, when the defibrillator is executed, epinephrine, respiratory rate, pulse rate, and all these factors uh, together. So, and then we ran into real world challenges of, for example, deploying that application, we had to deploy it on something known as a code cart. A code cart is in a closet when somebody codes in the hospital on each floor, there's a code cart, you can pull it out, it's got the defibrillator, it's got the epinephrine. We ran into this real world issue of, well, hold on, how do you keep an app with a device on it, like an iPad, charged? How do you deal with, does somebody have to log in with credentials before the code or do they log in afterwards? So we do these sort of these innovations, but we do it in the real world so that they actually become scalable um, and usable instead of dying on the vine, as you've suggested that a lot of projects end up like. So, so the scale, does that necessarily mean cloud? Scale means for us the, the concept that it's extensible beyond our four walls. And as we sort of define ourselves as sort of the typical American healthcare environment, that it can scale to all of American healthcare. The method for deployment in terms of rolling that um, is, is, and yes, in terms of scaling those platforms into the cloud. Um, so for example, obviously with running the Alexa tool to be able to scale that to the number of patients on any given day in America that have come home from having uh, and discharge instructions in hand. Yes, to scale that, it does mean the platforms in which you're gonna roll it out and delivering those through methods and partners in the cloud scenario. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Yep, Larry, thanks for having me.